Well, thank you. It's great to be here today. This, is, this has been a really interesting experience for me to prepare this talk because I'm normally an individual contributor and not the, the managers that you've been hearing uh, talk more recently. My name is Joanne McKay. I'm a project engineer in the aerospace industry. I work for a small firm, Integrity Engineering and Design Solutions. We are outsourced to a major aircraft parts manufacturer in the Phoenix area. I, I live in the Phoenix area. But first, because the theme here is uh, coming from the MIS background, a little bit about who I am um, in my MIS computer experience, because I realized I have a little history of computing in my background, because I'm old enough, and a little more about what it's like to work remote. I've been working full-time, pretty much full-time remote for about the fat, past five and a half years. And it's been working pretty effectively. It's been pretty cool. But a lot of pros and cons. How many people think that working from home sounds like the coolest thing ever? Uh, we've got a few. We've got a few. We'll talk about, like, what do you wear, right? <laughs> That's the first question. What are you wearing? I do not dress up in professional clothes <laughs> when I'm working from home. And then um, I do have uh, the pretty much the second half of it is I'm uh, calling it my case study, not realizing there was a big case study uh, competition in the lobby. Uh, but the program I've been working on has developed its own culture. Every company, every project develops its own culture, of course. But um, I think ours has worked pretty effectively, so I want to use that as an example. And then a few just lessons learned that I've, that I've come up with. So <laughs> Gandhi already gave some of this background. Um, I have, I, I'm old enough that I was in high school in the 70s. There were no computers at home. There were no computers at my, I think there might have been a computer at my high school. I was pretty nerdy, geeky. I wasn't even, I don't even know where the computer was. So, but probably a lot seeped into my consciousness or subconsciousness because my dad was, worked at Bell Labs, which was a, uh, in the day was well known for a lot of research and development type activities. And he was degreed in, as industrial psychology, but he had been doing software work for quite a while. And he wrote one of the first help routines for everything except billing in the telephone systems that got farmed out to, at the time, all of the telephone companies in the United States were combined, and it was the help system that went out to that. So it was, now it seems like a really pretty big deal. At the time, it's just whatever dad was doing. Um, so again, my undergraduate was at Virginia Tech. A degree is called Engineering Science and Mechanics. There I had my first ever computer course. It was in Fortran 77. Has anybody even heard of Fortran? Uh, oh. I should have said, who hasn't? That's scary. OK. Um, aerospace is a slow enough moving uh, um, beast that it still has some of the performance analysis uh, programs or models are still have a backbone of Fortran. So just because the life of aerospace projects are so long, they're 25, 30 year long projects. Um, but Fortran 77, what I'm showing you on the left, is uh, I was preparing this slide and it was uh, going down memory lane. So every single line of code was on a punched card. We've got the, the punch card with the, with the red background. That one is a Fortran format. I made sure it was the right one. Column six, I still remember that's your continuation line. <laughs> it's pretty scary what you remember. So when I would wrote a code, um, when you would write up a program for class, the machine that's shown in the, in the other picture, there would be a few of those in a little room stuck at the end of a hallway. And if you were lucky, there was one open when you wanted to go type up your, type up your little code. And then you'd end up with a stack of cards. If you look at punch cards online, you'll find pictures. You have a whole stack that you, that's your code, however many lines of code, that's how many cards you have. You hold them together with a rubber band. If you're smart, you write on the top of them with a pen, so if you dropped them, you could some chance of getting them back in order. And you would also put um, 
numbers on the far right, it's showing there's uh, a few notes. Those were notes you could add that didn't that the compiler didn't didn't absorb. So that was another place where you could number your cards so you could get it back in order. The course I took, every so then you took your cards, you walked to a little window, you gave it to the person, they somehow loaded it in the compiler, and then, I don't know, an hour or two later you came back and there was a printout, and either it compiled and ran and you got your result, or it didn't. And my professor had us run, um, we lost I think half a letter grade for every time you had to submit. And that includes all your typos, all your lines, cards in the wrong order. So I learned to be pretty precise pretty early. <laughs> he probably did me some favors, although we didn't think that at the time. So, And then I was very interested in uh, experimental fluid mechanics, actually. So that's how air and water move. And the University of Arizona had, uh, had a good program in that, so I came here uh, in the mechanical engineering department. The building I was in, I think, doesn't exist anymore. It was behind the student union. Uh, I was working with my thesis work was I wanted to take digital pictures of how water was flowing out of a jet. And I borrowed a CCD camera from the hospital. It probably was much lower resolution than what's in a five-year-old cell phone. The, uh, and I had to wire, hardwire to a mainframe computer, so I got really good at building video cables that ran like from the room where I could do my, had my water, and then ran down the stairways and off to the mainframe. So all the research work was done with mainframes. The data storage was on uh, tape. There's a picture of reel-to-reel -reel tape up there. Uh, and I can't remember exactly what the mainframes were. It was the VAX digital equipment did a, did a whole series that for years of, of VAX computers. And I went down memory lane Googling images of those. I was particularly, because this is a diversity series, I was particularly amused by this marketing picture of the woman looking adoringly at the computer. It just was <laughs> funny, seemed funny to me. Um, that is how I dressed when I first went to work in the 80s. <laughs> that is, I had skirts to work, and because uh, women didn't wear pants to work a lot then. It was a different time. So I had a decision when I was ready to type up my thesis. And they, I had a decision whether I was going to hire a typist to type it on a typewriter, or if I was going to type it on the mainframe where probably very much like HTML code, I don't actually do any HTML, but probably very much like that. At the beginning of every row, I'm saying what the font is going to be or if it's going to be in italics or something like that. So I, I, I went out on a limb. I, I decided I would actually type up my thesis myself on a mainframe. The printers were so unreliable that then that every single page I measured the margins to make sure it meant the one inch requirements <laughs> so that I could submit my thesis. It was, it's, um, it seems so silly now, but it was just normal then. Um, I go from that, first job is in aerospace up in the Phoenix area. I'm representing myself here, so I'm, I'm not going to give a lot of company names, but I uh, worked for a uh, uh, major aerospace company in, in the Phoenix area for a number of years doing performance analysis. So working on how, how do you get the um, pressurized air that you're going to use for a lot of the systems on the aircraft and for the heating and the cooling. And when I started, I was in a group of 12 people and we had three PCs to share among us. So again, kind of like going to type up the the programs in undergraduate school. Let's go see if there's any room at the PCs. When are you going to be done? Yeah. Um, lot of memos were handed out by hand. You'd print and hand them out. So it's a little mini history of, of computing. I had a chance to move to England for a couple of years. Again, I was working uh, for another aerospace company there. Uh, I had a work permit. They had had trouble finding anybody. It's very rural England. They'd had trouble finding people that were willing to move there. I, ha I had personal reason I wanted to move there at that time. My husband was uh, being, being transferred to, to work there for a short term. Worked out perfectly because the, they were able to get me a work permit fairly quickly. 
At that company, I had my second computer course. It was Fortran 90, a week of training on Fortran 90. That's all the formal computer training I've ever had. I've grown up with everything. Every time a new version of Excel came out, I'd go and explore all the menus and I'd do all the custom, set the custom menus for myself. They finally, a few versions ago, put what I normally did up there anyway, so now I don't modify all my menus very much. It's, it's, been, it's been interesting. I'm, my, my approach to, to technology and computers, because I started from scratch and grew up with it, is, okay, this is a tool. I think it should be doing what I want it to do, and then I just go and figure out how to figure out how to do it. Just explore the menus, and and um, well, now I do Google searches to to find what it is I want to do or troubleshoot whatever isn't working for me. Um, came back to Arizona that that time in in the UK ended. Came back to Arizona. Still, we're desktop PCs. Now we're getting into the time that you guys are kind of more familiar with. Then another opportunity, we had itchy feet, we loved living overseas, we had a chance to move to Japan. And I thought it was going to be a little bit less likely I'd get a work permit there. And I was indeed what you would, we called at the time, a trailing spouse. It was a wonderful adventure, I don't regret a minute of it. I did miss working. I, I wasn't, I taught English. Everybody who, who uh, is a native English speaker who goes to Japan uh, has, has fun opportunities. It's a great way to meet people and interact, to teach English. But it was, I was not able to work there. This was before anybody was interested in the remote working. Uh, in hindsight, that would have been fabulous. I think I would have been, a, it would have loved to have been able to work while I was there. Came back, did a change of pace, and moved to a different industry. And it's worked for a small consulting firm in the Tempe area that specializes in starting semiconductor fab facilities. Running them is one skill set, getting them started up is another one. The, the whole clean room technology, the special machines, the special um, um, supplies that are needed for it. I work, I'm no expert in semiconductors. I know, but coming from aerospace, I'm, I do know and I'm familiar with working with big projects and keeping big projects organized and coordinated and managed and consistent. And so they would bring me in whenever they had some bigger projects. I worked a couple in California. And then for a diversity um, a discussion, I worked uh, one that was in Saudi Arabia as well. And that was fascinating because I got to have several trips to Saudi Arabia um, via Paris, the, prog the project manager was in Paris, and then I would go to said killer business trips, but because um, they were relatively short, but really, really interesting experience. For that company, I was an independent consultant to the consulting firm, so I brought my own computer, and I don't like carrying heavy things, so by then I'm buying whatever the ultralight is that was the best option at the time. <laughs> so the um, yeah, that's my, that's, when uh, that gig kind of ended, I was looking around and I found a company that's uh, who I'm working for now. And the relationship that we have is um, another aerospace company in Phoenix. They had a very, were working on a very big project, bigger than they normally have. They didn't want to hire permanent employees to staff it. In aerospace terms, it was going to be a short project um, about seven years, so <laughs> that's short by aerospace standards. They didn't want to hire for that. So they wanted temporary workers, and there's, I'm going to distinguish a little bit, just because this is the role I'm in, there's uh, subcontract workers, which are your people who are coming in the office, they're temporary workers, they're your manpower, they can be engineers, uh, but they're your manpower people paid by the hour, they get paid overtime, rates, the rates go up for overtime, I think. And then, I don't know, I don't work as one of those. <laughs> and then they're being managed by somebody in the office. For the company that I'm working at now, they have an 18 month limit on that. Um, if you ever have any HR type discussions, there was some lawsuit with, I think even Microsoft, that they didn't want to be the subcontractors to be perceived as full-time employees. And so the company's reaction to that was, okay, 18-month limit and you're done. Outsource, 
they're buying our service. They're not hiring me as a person, they're hiring a service. And so it doesn't have the same time limits on it. And my company supplied probably 25 or 30 people for this project. And the, we've been between two and seven years. One of the terms to make sure that we maintain that arm's length outsource relationship is that we're going to be working off-site. And that's where our experiences come in with that. Let's see. So that outsource versus subcontract versus direct employee relationship is probably not anything you've had to worry about yet. Were there, was that clear enough? Did, any questions on that? Let's, okay, enough, enough nodding heads. So that's my personal experience and where I fit in as a remote worker, but what I got to, I got to learn a little more preparing this chart. It's like, who, who else are the remote workers? And for this talk, we're not talking about the Uber drivers. We're not talking about the freelance artists. We're not talking the freelance video people. Uh, we're not talking about those. We're talking about generally the, the corporate or company type employees that we're. So uh, there's a couple good resources online that you can click to if you have access to this, uh, to this presentation. What I found was interesting, I kind of rearranged her presentation. Uh, 80 or 90 of people want to work from home. Does that, does that sound about right? Does that surprise anybody? <laughs> Sounds like a dream, doesn't it? Um, the number's on the board, but what percentage do you think of jobs would, be, would that even work? Yeah, the number's up there. I know. I so the, this, the data was saying that uh, it won't even, it'll only work for about half of the jobs. Well, you know, half's okay. And then in, this is 2014 data, so a couple years ago, they're saying that uh, about 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. workforce does work from home. So almost everybody wants to, about half could, and about a quarter are working from home. That's huge compared to where we were a few years ago. Um, in 2000, I would have loved to have been working from Japan, you know, so I could have a job. It's, it's yeah, just interesting. Uh, what they found, and this is interesting, I'm full time from home, but what they found, and we'll talk about the challenges a little more, is a good balance is two or three days at home, and that gets you your balance of your time that you're not around the hubbub of the office so you can get work done and then the and the rest and the other part of the time that you need so you're developing those relationships in the office those balances are important in 2016 the data this uh, site is um, finding is saying that the average is over 50 so it's going to be people a little later in their career uh, college educated salaried non-union I have three of the four. I'm not salaried. <laughs> I'm paid by the hour. Uh, this was an interesting tidbit to me. So again, because this is a diversity theme, I thought this was actually kind of uh, important and interesting. Of dis employees who are disabled, 7% of those are working from home as part of their ADA accommodations, which is awesome. I'm actually surprised it wasn't a little bit higher than that. And then, the chart on the left, I also found interesting. The bottom line, the x-axis, if you can't see it, that is a salary or wages from lowest to highest, and they're in 10% chunks. So you've got the bottom 10%, the highest 10%. And then the y is the share of workers that are working primarily at home. What was really interesting to me is that it's a U-shaped curve. And at the lower end of the wage, grouping, you've got your call center employees, your sales, your, uh, your IT support call center type people, and then at the higher end is the people that we've been talking about, the, the 50 plus college educated salary. You've got your professionals, your managers, your academics. We have a friend who's a controller for a, for a restaurant group. She works mostly from home, goes into the office a couple days a month. Um, I'm an engineer, fit in there. Um, is this a U.S. thing? Uh, no, not really. On the right-hand side, the, the y-axis is countries. 
the x-axis is the share of managers who are allowed to work from home. And that goes up to 0.5, so it goes up to half. This was surveys of manufacturing firms, uh, about, so it was 2004, three and four years ago. So pretty recent for officially published data. The UK is letting uh, almost half of their employees are allowed to work from home at least one day a week during normal working hours. So if you can't see it, it's, it's the UK, Germany, the United States, France, Spain, Turkey. And then we're into developing countries. And the numbers for developing countries is really encouraging because it's got, uh, then we're, I figure where I stopped. So with Turkey, Colombia, Brazil, from the bottom, we've got Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Argentina, Chile. What the paper said, and this, is, this made perfect sense when I read it, was that as the infrastructure improves in these countries, the internet infrastructure, it, and the traffic congestion, congestion gets worse, it makes a whole lot more sense for people to be working from home. And so it's, it's working well for everybody. Does anybody here have anybody they know that works primarily from home? Who do you, who do you know? Um, it's my mentor for my project. Oh, okay. So, U.S. based or? U.S. based. Very senior. Uh, very senior. So over there in the uh, in the upper ten percent, probably. Yeah. Anybody else? Family members, friends? Uh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I've seen the work from home culture developing in India these days, but it's funny that not one Asian country figures out in the map. I know. Chart. I don't know if they just weren't part of the survey or. Yeah, because I, I, I was looking at least for China, if not India, but then I see not one Asian country over there. So I was like... My guess would be it just wasn't part of the survey. Possible. So, yeah. I work with people who... I, I talk to people in India working from home yeah, a I, few times a week, so yeah. I know it's happening. <laughs> I used to work, like, say, on an average one to two days mm -hmm. from home. So yeah. we are a pretty flexible working culture there. So. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about this later, but the time zone advantage to working from home is, is key as you go around. So, so what do you think some of the benefits are to working from home? Yes? You get to work when you want. Exactly. You get to work when you want. I found that very helpful. And uh, you don't waste time in commuting, basically, in Asian countries where the traffic is very high or whatever. You end up spending like uh, I've seen people spend four hours just commuting, four to four and a half hours in the city. So you end up saving those precious hours in the tiredness mm -hmm. and you feel fresh working from home. Yeah, I've worked with some people in Mexico, and they say to go across Mexico City is similar. It's uh, you'd be spending probably two hours each way commuting. On a good day. On a good day. <laughs> yeah, I work. Uh, I I live half an hour from the office where I work. Uh, the time commuting just annoys me when I do have to go in the office. Because you start to add up. If you're not doing that drive or that commute every day, you start to realize just how long it is. Then again, I don't have books on tape time. I don't have <laughs> that's the kind of stuff. Um, some other things that, uh, that, I've, that I thought of or found, we've talked about the flexibility. Um, taking breaks. You can work. Uh, another big one is that you can work part time. If you are in a role, uh, I have a number of friends who work part time. They're raising small kids. It's, it gives them the option to do the school runs morning and afternoon. They've got all that time in between. They're engineers. They want to work. They want to do their thing. But they've only got four or five hours a day. It's perfect. Works well. Um, one, the, one big thing about working from home is think about your personality. If you like, uh, who said you can get more work done from home? <laughs> Nobody's bothering you. Somebody said that. Um, if, you, if you've got that mindset, just let me get my work done, you're a good one for working from home. If you, uh, don't, if you consider uh, the office chit chat as wasting time, then you're a good one from working from home. It can be argued that it's not necessarily wasting time. I don't think it's entirely wasting time. But if you're the type of person that that really bugs, then yeah, it's good. Um, benefit, if you're this motivated type of person, you can work when you're sick. You can work when you're on vacation. Sometimes if you're very deadline focused, you, own, you have a lot of ownership in your project, that's important to you actually. It's really nice. 
Then we've got our, our lower overhead. You don't have to get, you don't have to buy the clothes, you don't have to clean the clothes, you don't have to. I, I, I do spend most of my working hours in um, my workout clothes and maybe a flannel shirt in the winter. <laughs> it's, it's very comfortable, it's very nice. Um, years ago they used to say if you're on the, if you're working remote like that, do get dressed up in business attire. I don't seem to need it, but then I'm one of the ones who thrives on autonomy. I do find if I want to be a little more alert, I do work on my posture um, and you know, sit on the edge of my chair and be a little more engaged, but that's um, transportation cost, drive time. <laughs> a friend of mine said I need to point out that you don't have to shower as much, so you don't have to spend as much on water and soap and toothpaste. So evidently she's not brushing her teeth as much. <laughs> so. It also reduces your carbon footprint. Yeah. It does, it does. Because and the carbon footprint for your company. Because, mm -hmm. because, because a lot of managers come in those one person driving a big gas guzzling vehicle SUV or something and then yeah. it's less traffic on the road, less of fuel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, so there is a flip side. Uh, these are some of the, the thoughts that I came up with on a flip side. If you are new in your career and you're working in a culture that is uh, at a company that isn't used to this yet, it may be difficult to get the visibility and the career advancement that you're looking for. I am not at that point in my career. I'm happy to do my work. Um, I own the tasks I have. I work with my groups around the world. I'm happy with that. I'm not looking for promotion. I'm, it's not where I'm at. If that is where you are and you're looking at working remote, make sure that you're communicating a lot to make sure that that's going to, going to work for you and get you where you want to go. Staying focused. It took me a while to get there. Um, staying focused, it's amazing how attractive doing dishes and laundry becomes when you're working from home. Um, I never, however, am interested in cleaning the floors. I just, <laughs> nothing will, will make me clean the floors. Um, it's, and on the structure, look at your personality. Do you, are you able to focus like that? Um, I, do you like that separation? As I, I have friends who they like leaving the house to go to work. They don't want work at home. I use my spare room, which we just call the office now. But I don't go in there very much on the weekends. I just it's not that's work. I don't want to be there. So it's even better is if I've actually turned off the computer, the work computer in that room. So another. Th Thing, there's actual research paper on this, is working too much. You tend to work, you're this personality, you're kind of driven, you're kind of focused. You're going to work either much earlier or much later. A lot of us, I think, have experience with the global. So the time zone, yes, I, you do end up working weird hours if you're working with people in, across the time zones. But you you're not defining an eight hour day and then you're done in general. So you can get some really weird hours. You might be working some really long hours more than you wanted. And then if you're salary, you're not getting paid for those. So there's been a lot of creep. Apparently there's been creep on how many hours people are expecting. And it's beyond the just you've got your cell phone and you're, you're available by phone and email 24 seven as a manager. Um, and then apparently there's data on the productivity and the availability expectations are higher if you're at home. Uh, and then this is the flip side. You get to work while you're sick or on vacation. And so that's, sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes you, know, you really do just need to go take a sick day and, and get yourself better. Um, documenting your productivity. If you do work in an environment where people don't trust that you're working from home, you might want to find a way to document it. I've got a really good relationship with my boss. I actually don't do a good job of documenting what I've done every minute of every day to prove that I've been effective the whole time. Yeah. Um, all your tech has to work. So you've got all the normal tech that your company has, your laptop, your, v your but what you've got on top of that is you've got your own internet that you're responsible for. Uh, so uh, I'm talking to MIT. 
that's department, but you have to be your own IT person. Um, onboarding process may be incomplete. The, um, it could be that you've come on to a new project, you're not walking around and looking over people's shoulders, and so you don't pick up that knowledge that you would just by seeing what somebody else is doing. So you might be missing the acronyms list for this project or some other tidbit of information that you just pick up organically. Um, so in general, for transportation, your carbon footprint is less, but I leave my AC on all day now because I'm at home and I'm working there. So some of your costs do go up. Your heating and your air conditioning costs might go up because you need to be in a comfortable environment to work. And you might have chosen to upgrade your internet speed package so that you <laughs> things aren't as slow. So kind of good pros and cons. For the company, the company now has a bigger skill set, a bigger base to, to choose from. They can, if the perfect person for this job is three time zones away, doesn't want to move, you can still hire them. It's, it's good. The retention, somebody, if you ever have an HR series, somebody can tell you the value of retention. Uh, that's keeping the employees that you already have. You don't have to spend the money to, or the six months of ramp up time on a new employee. Uh, if you keep them, that's better for the company. With that, aerospace tends to have very low turnover. You guys might be working in areas that have a bit higher turnover where this would be more important. You can keep the employee where the husband or wife moves to go to grad school. You can keep the one who has, is going to have um, kids or got burned out because they're doing telecons at 5 in the morning every day. They can do it from home. They don't have to come into the office. Apparently, there's uh, reduced sick time for all those people who are working while they're sick. <laughs> yeah. uh, less business travel. I um, worked a job where I was working a testing program, it's a mechanical testing program, so big equipment, big facility. It's in Mexico. I did a lot of travel back and forth, but once the test program was, ex was established, I did the rest of it from home. And so they weren't paying for my travel expenses to go, to, to go there all the time. Let's see. And here's our carbon footprint. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, the company can have some challenges too. So I work in, I mentioned that aerospace is a fairly slow moving industry. That's a good thing because you're flying on our airplanes and you want them to be reliable and safe and that happens because, it's, because it is a slow moving industry that learns from, moves gradually over time. What comes with that also, and may or may not be where you end up, is managers aren't necessarily comfortable with the remote workers. There's not that feeling of trust that you're actually going to be doing something when you're home and not billing them for doing your laundry. Uh, and they also don't have that feeling of supervision. I think that's going to change. You saw from just, I don't feel that old, but you saw from my timeline, I've come from punch cards to working remote on a project around the world. Um, that's a lot to process. The, and so I think the management systems, the management attitudes are going to take a while to take a while to catch up. Uh, I wouldn't have stayed where I am as long if I didn't have a manager that I got along with. Great. It's, it's, they're there. They're there in every industry, but it's a challenge. And, and I asked my boss, what do you think I should say? He said, it's really work on the communicating, almost over communicate. And it's uh, for certain types of jobs and employees, make sure that you've actually defined the task in much more detail than you originally thought than you would need to, where you could just go by somebody's desk and check in and see what's going on. Um, you do lose the water cooler conversations. That's the other side of the, that's, that's the Yahoo argument. So they famously, Yahoo wanted everybody to, all the remote people back in the office. They were in a crisis time. They wanted to, she wanted to um, drive innovation, which tends to happen when you put people together in the same place and that water cooler conversations happen. Um, I, I, what I read said nobody actually figured out if that worked. I, I'm not sure if it's worked. But that's the idea. It's, that's what people 
maybe you guys are going to be developing the tools that help that and the processes and the attitudes that make that work effectively remote as well, the equivalent of your water cooler conversations. Already talked about career development, but that's an issue for the company as well. They want to develop the, it's, it's so for you and for the company, maybe not having a, more challenges developing the junior employees is, is not good for either of you. And figuring out who's a match. We talked about the personality. Well, that's the manager's job too, is to figure out is this a personality that's going to be a good, a good fit for it. So, and then this might, you guys might have a lot more to say about this. I'm, it's not such an uh, issue where I am, but in industries that have a much higher uh, demand for security, for data, the working from home probably has extra layers of requirements that y'all probably know more about than I do. <coughs> this is kind of the fun part for me. Um, most of my coworkers I've met, I've either worked with them for, you know, some, I've been working there five and a half years. Some of them I haven't seen in years, and others of them I have never met. So just put yourself in that position. What, what do I know about these people? This is, we've talked about um, your, your perceptions and your biases. Well, what do you build those on? What do I know? Okay, I know their gender. <laughs> Um, I know their name, I know their voice, <laughs> I know their accent. If they chose to put a photo on LinkedIn or on the company instant message system, I, I have one picture of what they look like <laughs> on one day. My LinkedIn picture is a little old, with long hair. <laughs> yeah. I know what they put if they're sharing a screen and they happen to let their wallpaper show, I know that. What do I know? I don't know very much. So, which is actually a great leveling field, I think. Uh, it's just what they're doing, what they're producing, what they have to say. It's, uh, it's, I, think it's, I think it's great. I don't know the traditional things that we talk about with uh, diversity considerations. I don't know their age. I don't know their race, ethnicity. Anything, you can, you can come up with the list as easily as I can of what I don't know about them. And so, again, with any diversity consideration, I think you've had other lectures that have, have talked about how you're developing your, we all have prejudices, we all have biases. Well, here, it's like there's an extra layer because you don't have very much to work with. You, we're, we're all like, you know, you meet somebody and all you have to do is, you know, shake their hand. It's like you've already formed an opinion you've got a little less to go on here, and maybe that's not a bad thing for making it a little more even. So, it's kind of it's interesting, I think. So, my example case, I've kind of mentioned it. It's, it's a very, it's a large program. It's, uh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I have a question regarding the previous slide. Yes. So, like, don't you miss out on social life because you know every day you're just at home and you don't get to really meet people face to face. So there is a lot that we learn when we interact with people directly and spend time with them mm -hmm. rather than just you know uh, phone calls regarding the work. So don't you miss out? Yes, if if that didn't make it on the audio, he has an excellent question. Don't you miss that social interaction and developing? You can fill in the gaps where I don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah where you don't have that personal relationship. Um, we're, I'm probably going to run out of time, so I might not get to these slides, but I've got, I have my own systems that I've developed for building those relationships. Um, I, I've been told that it's easier for me because I'm a woman. Um, I also, oh, in case you didn't know, I forgot to say this at the beginning, women are still only about 10% in the hard engineering. Uh, disciplines, the mechanical engineering, the aerospace, the, the, so I'm still a bit unusual and have been my whole life. And people have told me that this is a little easier for me because I'm a woman. I use that laptop screen, that, that um, wallpaper. Oh, those are cute kids. 
oh, where did you take that picture? Do you like to fish? <laughs> Do you? And so gradually I grasp any opportunity I have. If I'm not, not going to meet them, I, or even if I might meet them in the future, I grasp those opportunities um, and, and build on them. If you ever have a chance, and most companies will do this, you, you'll be in to meet everybody and get oriented. Even that one time you meet and you have lunch together in the cafeteria is enough to really help that down the road. Um, in the program, I'm going to go a little faster because I'm not going fast enough. Uh, I think I've given you the passage. It's a, it's a big program. It was people dispersed. The part of the project that I'm on now is so layers of relationships. The stars are the ones where I work. Uh, the project I'm on now, I'm working regularly with a customer in Germany. Um, the company I'm outsourced to, I'm working with people from France, the UK, Toronto, New Mexico, various places in Arizona and California. And then our supplier has people in the UK and Pennsylvania and, and India. And some of these people I've met once. <laughs> Some of them I haven't met at all. Um, but we've got a long-term enough relationship. I have some kind of fun things that I do. Well, I think they're fun. I don't know. If a meeting gets canceled because there's a holiday in a particular country, I'll grab the Wikipedia um, description of that holiday because I've got to tell you, I'm not so familiar with the Indian holidays. I'm learning over time as I cancel meetings due to Indian holidays what these holidays are and, and, and just have a little fun with it. And then in the next meeting, so what did you do? What's the special events that you, special traditions with that holidays? You can do those little social things. It doesn't, even though we're working with all these geek engineers, totally focused, get work done, we're all human, so. And lots and lots of IMing chats. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, let's, let's go on a little bit to that. Uh, so, Skills that seem to matter even more when you're remote are effective email management. I actually have a friend who has industrial engineering degrees who is working on her PhD in effective email management. It is that big of an issue in the workplace. I, yeah, I'm getting nods, I'm getting nods. Um, so because nobody's going to stop by your desk to say, hey, did you get that done? You're, it's all coming by email, so you've got to stay on top of your email and figure out how to do it and develop your systems. Um, and the communication in the industry I'm in, the communication is primarily by email. We're going to look back in 10, 20 years and say that's archaic, but it's where we are now. Um, so be sure that you're very clear because you're not going to have the person swinging by your desk to say, what did you mean? <laughs> Did you mean to say that? I didn't understand. They're not going to say that. They're going to bin your, bin your email and ignore it, and, and then you weren't effective. Um, this, <laughs> timely. This is where it's, you know, don't let the email sit. That's part of your email management system is uh, making sure you keep up with them. Am I perfect? No. Am I 85, 90%? Yeah, and that's gotten me, that, that keeps me with a pretty good reputation. Um, this is going to sound really obvious, but work on your good judgment for emailing the right people at the right time with the right urgency and the appropriate follow-up. You're dispersed. You're all over the place. If you didn't include everybody who needed to know on that email, on my project, <laughs> there's another woman and I, we kind of joke, we spend all our time adding people to the email chain who should have been in the original email chain. Um, it's 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 a skill, you'll develop it, but it's one to think about as, as you're going. And that's a, one thing, is a ha that's another way to keep your group included. Make sure that your group all knows what's going on. It's especially remote, I know I, I mentioned this before, every single line in here I can give you an example of somebody who's not doing it effectively. <laughs> These are all personal lessons learned. Understand your technology. Um, Know that you can do your own backups and updates and all that kind of stuff. Calendar management. People can't see if you're in the office. They don't know your car's in the parking lot. They didn't see you at the water cooler. Where is she? Keep your calendar up to date. Block out your kid pickups. Block out your personal trainer appointments. Um, 
If you haven't had a lunch away from your desk in two weeks, block out a lunch. Um, just put yourself a meeting. I put lots of meetings for, or if I need that quiet time, I've got a pretty heavy meeting load. If I need quiet time to actually get a task done, I block it on my calendar and I'm the only person invited. <laughs> it so works. Mm -hmm. So you share your calendar yeah, so the company, big corporate, the calendars, they can't see what's on the calendar, but they can see the busy times. That's, uh, thank you for asking that. <laughs> it's so obvious to me, because it's my day-to-day -day life. Um, I can't imagine how to set up a uh, meetings if you couldn't see the calendars for most of the people that are gonna attend the meeting. It's, it's challenging. I think Link even shows the status based on your calendar. It does. So we're so the company I work for is using um, Link. Yes. Yeah, so Link. I'm going. So where I am etiquette. Where do I have? So I. So Link is a product where you use for instant messaging and chats. The company I work for, we use it for our phone calls and our meetings. Now we've been using it for meetings for a long time. The phone calls is new. Uh, well, a couple of years new. Um, the link, you can set your status. This is invaluable, I mean, keep track of it. It will automatically set whether you're busy or in a call based on your, on your calendar and if you are actually in a call. And, um, and that's a great way to find out if somebody's there and just uh, ping them to ask a quick question. The, uh, and then you can use uh, to, to get a hold of people, you can set a tag so when somebody comes out of a meeting or out of a call, you'll get a pop-up and I use that constantly as well. We've got a lot of people auditing. I think I'm, yeah, that's not telling you guys anything new. I'm looking at the clock and I know that we have six minutes and a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a lot of nuts and bolts. I'd be happy to stay. Um, there's enough people nodding that some of you already know a lot of this. It's, the rest of this was all just nitpicky little set your I am status if you want to go away. Um, uh, little, uh, little tips and tricks about um, biggest thing, get a wireless headset. That's my biggest message. <laughs> My life changed when I finally got off the tethered headset and I could actually go to the kitchen and make a cup of tea. Uh, wireless headset and very quick use of the mute button. <laughs> the mute button and the wireless headset are your, are your biggest friends for working remote. Um, and, it's, and it's your developing your own personal style, making that effort to make sure you're part of a team and that the team knows who you are. And, Understanding that there's not going to, it might not work for you all the time, but it might work for you part of the time. Are there any other, I don't think the quiz will take very long, are there any other really questions before the quiz? Yes. The so noise is in the background. I know you say put on mute, but then if you have a spouse and a child in the background and you're leading a meeting, how do you deal with those things? Um, so I'm lucky enough that I don't have any of that in the background, but I did have my roof replaced while I was running things. <laughs> Um, judicious use of the mute button. People are pretty tolerant. I mean, I hear stuff all the time. Babies and cats and birds and other people's rooms being replaced. And um, just a pretty high tolerance. But find to maybe find a workspace where you can close the door. That's, yeah, just be aware. Because sometimes it's surprising people aren't so aware what's in their background. <laughs> Yeah. Any other any other uh, questions along those lines? Yes. How do you manage the time difference? And also, is there an ideal like uh, ideal way to work from home or like work in an office? So let's say that if you're gonna work at home, do it two to three days a week, or should there be like a set number of hours, and that's easier to block it around that? Uh, so the second question was about how do you manage your time? Is there a recommendation for how many hours in the office and setting your time? That is completely between you and your company and what works for you in my experience. The other question was how do you manage the time differences? I am this geeky. There is a, a wonderful website called worldtimeserver.com that I, there's probably other ones now, but I've been using this one for so long I go there. It has a meeting planner. I extracted it and put it in my an Excel sheet and I have columns for all the places. So I'm going from, I put them in order, so I'm going from California all the way around to India. These are all the 
locations on my, and I blocked the hours per day that will work with the people in those locations because I was having a heck of a time scheduling meetings. And be aware that daylight savings time changes at different times on different weeks, whether you're in the US or in Europe. And then it doesn't change in India or the Arizona. So <laughs> I actually, this is, this is for the, this spring's uh, daylight savings time change. I had that intermediate time change. And you think about things like, oh, the work weeks are different in different parts of the country. And God, he's going to kill me because we haven't done the quiz yet. But be aware, just make notes and make yourself a system. And then decide who's going to give up the flexibility. The people in India tend to be the ones who have to work after dinner. That's just to be, because it's a, our program is a European and US centric program. So it just varies. Yes? Um, as far as the hiring process goes, is there like a screening process as to which like you would be a better fit for a type of work like this? Or is it just kind of you trust employees right off the bat to be productive at home? How does that work? My personal experience, so the question is, is there a special hiring process for finding these, these right types of people who are a good fit for this? You will have to ask an HR expert about that. The, my experience and the people I'm working with were all pretty, uh, let's say, mature. <laughs> we have a lot of experience. We're hired specifically for this role. And I actually don't know how my outsource boss decides if we're going to work or not, <laughs> if it's going to work out. It's where he finds us all through word of mouth, networking. You guys have heard that. Uh, and then he makes some sort of a judgment. An HR expert, uh, there's a ton of stuff online, so you might be able to find something online about that. Uh, quiz, we need to wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate the questions. Mm -hmm.